She jumped out of bed, spread the clothes over the rails and opened the window wide so that the air might flood the room and she and her clothes might win the first freshness of the morning. She dressed herself in an old skirt, blouse and shoes, went into the kitchen, lighted the fire, planted a big oval pot filled with water on the, on the fire, returned to the bedroom and remade the bed. When the water in the big oval pot boiled, she brought from the little yard a galvanised bath, set in the middle of the floor, poured the boiling water into it, cooled it and judging a suitable heat with the tips of her fingers. Then she stripped herself naked, stepped into the bath and washed her body all over, pinching with pride the plumpness of her thighs and the firmness of her breasts, button red at the tips. Her Nicholas was going to find a lot of stimulating charms in his Ella. Naked and dry, she hurried back to the bedroom and dressed slowly, with constant self-admiration, putting on the white chemise, drawers and petticoat, afterwards washing her teeth, rubbing them briskly with, br with a brush sprinkled with camphorated chalk. Naked and dry, she hurried back to the bedroom and dressed slowly, with constant self-admiration, putting on the white chemise, drawers and petticoat, afterwards washing her teeth, rubbing them briskly with a brush sprinkled with camphorated chalk. The only one in the house who did it. She opened her mouth wide before a small looking glass and admired them, for they were even white, strong and really beautiful. Then returning to the kitchen, she emptied the soiled water from the bath and placed the bath back on a nail in the wall beside the privy. She felt proud in her new clothes and thought of the exciting time she'd have when Nicholas would be helping her to take them off, one by one, in readiness for the crowning of their connection after Holy Church had incorporated the two in one. She would give her Nicholas a good time and in an hour or two, all she had would be his forever and ever, amen. She filled the kettle, placed it in the heart of the blazing fire and called up her mother. The breakfast was a chill and bitter one. Johnny alone exhilarated, spooning an egg into him in honour of the great thing that was ha to happen soon in God's holy temple, while Ella and her mother sat sad, busy avoiding each other's eyes, sad, silent and sad at the table. When I'm a big man, said Johnny, I'll be a bugler like Nicholas, so I will. And blow revel when the day begins and the last post when the day ends. Tom and Michael in their letters say I'm doing well, murmured Ella. I hope you'll never be a soldier, said Johnny's mother, and Johnny's joy was dimmed. When she had nib nibbled a little toast and drunk a little tea, Ella went to her bedroom, washed her hands and mouth to get rid of any lingering crumbs, put on her coat and hat carefully, sat down on the bed and cried a little. Everything would be stretching out in front of me fine, she thought pitifully, if it wasn't for the mind of my mother. She was ready for an emergency, so she was, having with her something old and something new, something barred and something blue, and a lucky sixpence for in her shoe. Everything in apple pie order, if it wasn't for the mind of my mother. Here's the cab for you, she heard her mother's voice cry from the kitchen. Ella got up quickly, came into the kitchen and watched the mother putting back the things that had been used at their breakfast. Goodbye, mother, said Ella. Goodbye, said her mother shortly. Something's up between them again, thought Johnny. One had imagined the mother would be proud of her girl, was going to marry a soldier. He saw Ella's lips quiver and he felt a catch in his throat. He snatched up his cap from a chair and went out into the street to watch the cab and to wave a fond farewell. Ella stood watching her mother for a minute, her hand patting the hat on her head. Aren't you going to say something to me before I go? She pleaded. You've made your bed, you'll have to lie in it, replied her mother. Ella went swiftly from her mother's presence, straight to the waiting cab. A side glance showed her figure standing at the door, intently sh staring at what was happening outside O'Cassidy's house. Far down the street, a ragged man with a head bent and eyes fixed on the ground was singing querously, the anchors weighed. The driver held the door of the cab open for her and Ella, tightening her lips to show all onlookers what she was made of, climbed into the cab telling the cabman to drive to St Mary's Church, while Johnny waited to wave his cap in token of farewell to Ella, waved a fond farewell to him from the window of the cab. The driver got on his seat, caught up the reins, said giup giup to the mare and the cab began to move away from the sorrowful song. A tear fell gently from her eye when last we parted on the shore. My bosom heaved with, a, with many a sigh, to think I ne'er see her more. The song suddenly stopped and the singer stooped to pick up a penny that had rattled on the pavement beside him. When the singer started again as the cab was passing by him and Johnny waited, cap in hand, to wave a fond farewell to Ella. The anchors weighed, the anchors weighed. 
Farewell, farewell, remember me. The singer sang, with his head bent and his eyes looking down at the ground. But Ella's face did not appear at the window, nor did a well-kept hand wave a farewell to Johnny, though we watched, cap in hand, till the cab turned out of sight round the corner of the street, and so the bride went forth to meet her bridegroom.